It's April 2nd, 2018, but more importantly, it's Monday, the beginning of a new week. The Los Angeles Angels take the field to play Cleveland, but Shohei Otani isn't available. He's resting. The day before, he made his MLB pitching debut, throwing six innings and allowing three runs against the Athletics. It was good enough to collect his first major league win. Before Otani came to America, his ability on the mound was well understood by the baseball community. As a 20-year-old, he tied the record for the hardest thrown pitch in NPB history, 162 kilometers per hour, or 101 miles per hour if your radar gun measures imperial units. In 2016, he put up probably the most complete two-way season in the history of professional modern baseball. The Nippon Ham Fighters star tossed 140 innings with an ERA under 2 and rocked an OPS over 1,000 in 382 plate appearances. But there was skepticism in the industry about his ability to hit in Major League Baseball. During his first spring training, where Otani struggled against the likes of Clayton Kershaw, one anonymous big league scout told Yahoo that he's basically like a high school hitter because he's never seen a good curveball. It wouldn't take long for Shohei to prove them wrong. He was about to dismantle a century of positional specialization in the span of a week. It's Tuesday, and Shohei Otani is back in the lineup. He's batting 8th against the Cleveland Spiders. Yeah, I'm still calling them that. After a Francisco Lindor walk, Jose Ramirez jumps on the Angels with a two-run blast in the top of the first. In the bottom of the inning, the Spiders starting pitcher Josh Tomlin decides that he would like to have an adventure. Mike Trout homers, he does that occasionally. And then, after three singles and a walk, which is extra weird because Tomlin doesn't walk anybody, Shohei Otani moseys up to the plate in a tie ball game with the bases loaded. With the count even on 1-1, one and one, Tomlin makes Otani look bad on a curveball. But when he tries it again, things don't go as planned. A wild pitch scores Cole Calhoun, a massive disappointment. It sure would have been nice if Otani's first career home run was a grand slam. Instead, he'll settle for this. That's out toward right center field. Going back on it is Zimmer. At the wall. Big fly Otani son! The first big fly Otani son! Josh Tomlin's curveball, well located with an above average spin rate, is sent into the outfield stands with an exit velocity over 104 miles per hour. It is at this moment that the anonymous MLB scout discovers what crow tastes like. In his second at bat, Tomlin tries his cutter and Otani hits a single off the glove of Jason Kipnis, again over 100 miles per hour off the bat. In the 8th inning, he battles Spiders reliever Zach McAllister, falling off a couple inside fastballs. When McAllister throws one right down the middle, Otani singles to center field. It's his third hit of the day, all of which had triple digit exit velocity. He finishes with the game's highest win probability as the Angels end up crushing Cleveland by a score of 13 2. It's a good start for the week of Otani, but Wednesday will hold a much greater challenge. Corey Kluber on the mound. It's a harrowing sight for any big league hitter, but an especially unwelcome one for a rookie. From 2014 to 2017, Corey Kluber was the definition of an elite starting pitcher. In fact, if you look up elite starting pitcher in the dictionary, you'll be unsuccessful because elite starting pitcher isn't a word, it's three words. And if you just search elite, it shows you a picture of David Fletcher. Still, in those four seasons leading up to the week of Otani, Kluber was second among starting pitchers in FIP and F4, as well as third in ERA. During that stretch, he won the American League Cy Young Award. Twice. A crazy outcome for a guy who was never a big prospect and didn't debut until age 25. The Klubot success was a result of his deep and varied repertoire. He threw five pitches with confidence. His sinker, thrown with a two-seam grip, was used most often, but he also had a serious breaking ball utilized as his strikeout pitch. It was sometimes classified as a slider, sometimes a curveball. According to Kluber, it's neither. But the clue ball, as I call it, was tantamount to his success once he got ahead in the count. In his first at bat against Kluber, Otani quickly goes down 0-2 to Kluber's sinker and cutter. They take two completely different paths, but the destination ends up being the same. One can almost sense that Kluber is testing the young hitter. This is clue ball territory, but he gets the called strike three from his four-seamer. Maybe with a little help from Jan Gomes as well. No breaking pitches here, just the fastball variants. In Otani's second at bat of the day, Gomes once again sets up for the fastball outside on a 1-1 count. 
but it catches a little too much of the plate. Shohei Otani has just taken one of the best pitchers on the planet deep. Angel Stadium is loving it. Otani Mania is now in full force. Later in the game, Otani adds a single off Cody Allen, another good pitcher. This contest ends in the 13th inning with Zach Cozart hitting a walk-off homer. It's the third win of a streak. Starting in April, the Angels will win nine games in which Otani appears. By April 14th, they'll have a division lead and the best record in the American League. It starts to go downhill after that, but at this juncture, Otani and the Angels are clicking in a big way. After an off day, the Oakland Athletics come to town for a weekend series. Daniel Gossett takes the mound for the A's and finds himself in a tricky spot against Otani in the second inning. He misses on a couple of fastballs, leading to a 2-0 count. Here's a weird thing about 2018 Shohei Otani. He was the best hitter in the league after a 2-0 count. By a lot. And it's a small sample size, sure, but while you're commenting that on YouTube, Otani is going yard. That's driven out the center field. That's got some sound. Otani son has done it again. 449 feet, 112.4 miles per hour off the bat. That ball was absolutely blasted. It's his third consecutive game with a home run. In the fifth inning, A's reliever Yusmero Petit is pulled after loading the bases. Otani comes to the plate in an 8-6 ball game to face Liam Hendricks. Ball one, ball two, ball three, ball four. It's an RBI walk, the first base on balls of Otani's career. Not as fun as a homer, but it's still a net positive for the Angels. In the seventh inning, Otani once again has a chance with runners in scoring position, and he gets a little unlucky. He hits a sharp grounder to Matt Olson, who makes the force out himself. That ball was hit over 109 miles per hour, with a hit expectancy over 50%. Even in making an out, Otani is crushing the baseball. He'll finish 2018 with the 10th highest average exit velocity. After Otani has sat down, the Angels rally to score five runs and take the lead for good. It's another dub for the Halos. And on Saturday, Otani rests. So far, we've been exposed to Otani the hitter. We've compared him to other great batsmen around the league, and he definitely measures up. But he's scheduled as the starting pitcher on Sunday, and that prowess as a two-way player is what makes him such an unbelievable athlete. Shohei Otani, once a weekday slugger, is now a weekend starter, and he comes out of the gate scorching hot, getting two triple S's against Matt Joyce and New York Mets legend Jed Lowry. What's the triple S? A swinging splitter strikeout. I'll be keeping a counter of these as the game progresses. The splitter is a pitch that's not necessarily in vogue in current Major League Baseball. It constitutes between 1 and 2% of all pitches thrown in a given season. The 1980s were the height of the splitter's popularity in MLB, a decade that featured many split-fingered fastballers, like 1986 Cy Young winner Mike Scott. But the splitter, as well as its cousin, the forkball, is extremely popular in East Asian baseball, hence Otani's mastery. Masahiro Tanaka, also of Japan, throws one, as does the American Josh Lindblom, who added the splitter to his repertoire while pitching in the KBO. And the pitch could receive a boost in notoriety with former number one overall pick Casey Mize making waves with it in 2020. In the second inning, Chris Davis with a K lines out to Fishboy. That brings up Matt Olson, who, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you, not gonna have a good day. Swing and miss, swing and miss, swing and miss. Otani's third frame is headlined by a pair of swinging strikeouts, again off that devastating splitter. Shohei cranks it up to 99.6 against Marcus Simeon in the fourth, but he also throws a 68 mile per hour curveball to Matt Joyce, who correctly points out that it was well off the plate. Come on, Blue! In the fifth inning, Otani commits an act of designated hitter on designated hitter violence by blowing away Chris Davis. That brings up Matt Olson. Not the best day. A mediocre day. Ah, fine. A bad day. It's a bad day to be Matt Olson, But it's a good day to be Shohei Otani. He's perfect through five. Jonathan Lucroy flies out to begin the sixth inning. One down. Then, Steven Piscotti hits a weak ground out. Two down. 
With an 0-2 count, Otani has Jake Smolinski on the ropes, and he doesn't hesitate. Just listen to the roar of that crowd, and it's another swinging splitter strikeout to boot. The broadcast makes a classic gaffe in the seventh, immediately jinxing Otani's run at perfection with the dreaded Chiron. Marcus Simeon breaks up the perfect game and no-no with a one-out single, and Mets legend Jed Lowry follows up with a four-pitch walk. The runners advance on a Chris Davis ground out, and that brings up... Ah, jeez, Matt Olson. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Hey, look, it's a 3-1 count. That's a serious hitter's count. In response, Otani runs it up to 99. He misses his spot, but gets the strike. And then, on full count, you know what it is. Sorry, Matt Olson. The week of Otani is over, but let's look at the final numbers. They're pretty mind-blowing. As a designated hitter in three games, Otani hit over 400 and slugged over 1,000, collecting three home runs and driving in seven during the week of Otani. He accrued .4 F war for this offensive outburst. His final pitching line, 7 innings pitched, no runs, a hit, a walk, and 12 strikeouts. That's .5 F4 as a pitcher. If he did this every week of a baseball season, he'd be a 24-win player all by himself. But I think the way he got there is what makes it so interesting. Let's put it this way. During the week of Otani, he had the 5th longest home run in the majors and also threw the 2 fastest pitches by a starter so he went deep with the best power hitters and dominated the top fireballers. In a week, he crushed the century-long embargo on two-way players that began when Babe Ruth joined the Yankees. He lit up a league where athletes dedicate their careers to either throwing a baseball hard or hitting a baseball hard. Never both. He did both. In the grand scheme of what is hopefully a long career in Major League Baseball, detractors might call this week a mere flash in the pan. I call it a lightning strike. He demonstrated his ability as an ace pitcher and middle-of-the-order masher like a baseballing supernova. Fast forward to 2020, and Otani has pitched just four innings in the last two years due to a torn UCL and now a forearm strain. You know, the comedian Mitch Hedberg once said that an escalator can't break. It can only become stairs. Shohei Otani can't break. He can only become a slugger. Purely at the plate, Otani is actually quite similar to his fellow 2017 Rookie of the Year, Ronald Acuna Jr., as their career rate stats share a serious resemblance. The man just rakes. I don't know what the long-term outlook for the Otani two-way experiment looks like, but he's already left his mark on the game. His success, brief as it may have been, has certainly inspired clubs to develop their own generation of two-way players. Yet, Otani still remains unique due to his status as both a frontline starting pitcher and middle of the order power bat. And, for one week in April, we got to see him do both. I think that's definitely worth remembering. Thank you so much to my newest patrons. To see your name here, go to patreon.com slash foolishbaseball.